You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and there's Matt Reynolds over there. And what's uh, up? Happy anniversary, Matt. Thank you. It is. Uh, let's see. What is what is next Thursday when this comes out? Yeah, we will have just passed at that at that point. By the time this by the time this releases, I will be uh, celebrating my twentieth anniversary with my beautiful bride Rachel. And so that's crazy. a long time. It's a long time for people that are forty. <laughs> nah. we, we followed the Scott Hambrick plan. Yeah, that's, that's got good. married young. Start popping out babies. Wish I popped out a few more. Yeah, our anniversary is the 31st. It will be the 23rd, I think. I remember when you guys had your 20th. Yeah. Years ago. It's been a long time. It's been good. It's been my whole adult life. Yeah, it's kind of cool to be. Uh, uh, I have been married for almost more than 50% of my life. Yeah, I'm there. Not quite, but I'm close. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, you've, li- uh, you've lived with Rachel longer than you live with your parents. That's true. That's true. And Rachel and I, we've been together since 97, so that's 23 years. Me, so, and, me and Charity have either been dating or engaged or married since about 1989 or 90. <laughs> yeah. I would actually say that we've both been that since eternity passed when it was set forth and predestined that we would eventually be together. Gross. <laughs> We've been we've already been together for all eternity, past and future. Um, I coined a word yesterday. Did you, you see did. it? Yeah, I did. What was it? Eco, oh, it was the eco. Don't tell me. It's the opposite of oaky, right? Yeah, it's eco. It's oaky spelled backwards, but yeah, it's eco, what we call eco, the Californians eco. that are fleeing the cultural and economic dust bowl they've created and coming yeah. back to the Midwest and to Texas to ruin Texas. Yeah, and we're in, in Oklahoma and. Uh, you know, we're full. I don't feel like we have a ton of those. I don't know. Maybe we've got more than I think in Missouri. Oh, they're coming. They're coming. Well, of course. It's cheap cheap living out here. Well, until they get here and they make all their bad yeah, decisions. Yeah, I know. But, you no, know, I'm, I'm well aware. Canada, they're, uh, they're the equivalent of their federal funds rate flipped negative yet, uh, last night. Oh, really? Uh-huh. What a weird, isn't this a weird time? Uh, so it's the weirdest, it's the weirdest, man. It's yeah. the weirdest, but I've been, I've been saying maybe a little deflation. Yep. I know. I know. I, and you did say that. I don't you want said, I don't want to I, believe we were it. talking about this and I was like, look, we're probably, are we, uh, Scott Hambrick, are we headed for inflation because of all of the money that the federal government or the federal governments in the Western world are pumping into the culture and you, you noted that, in fact, none of that is, in fact, real new money. It's not, they're not printing money, right? They are, they're buying debt. Yeah, the way. And eventually that debt's going to go bad. And when that debt goes bad, then it actually gets wiped off the table and there's less money. Yeah, we like to talk about the printers go, brr, you know, and they print money, but they really don't. What they do is they, they loan you money that never existed and they just write numbers down in your bank account and then you buy yeah. a house with those numbers. But if you buy the house and you never pay the loan back, that money is destroyed and it makes the money supply contract. And uh, so that's one deflationary pressure. Then, of course, if nobody's working, if the unemployment rate is enormous, and it is, then people can't afford to buy things. That makes demand go down. That's right. deflationary. Um, and, and there are some other factors, too. But uh, I, I'm not sure that it's deflation, but it's not clear to me that it's inflationary. Uh, right. So it's interesting, and you know a whole bunch maybe of they'll balance each other out. And maybe that's what they're hoping. The same. I'm I'm hoping for the deflation, which yeah. but uh, it'll be it'll be disruptive for sure. Sure. Good times. We've been cursed with living in interesting times. Yes, uh, it has been very strange. <laughs> it has been very strange. We closed on our rural land, and um, you know you can't. You can't go in. You got to call, and then they got to let you in. They won't let your real estate agent in. No, <laughs> like it's so weird. It's so weird. Everything's so strange. Uh, restaurants are like that. You know, we go to a restaurant. You have to get a reservation. Then you go and get there. Then you text a number, and then you sit out in your 
car and then they come out and they're like, all right, we're ready for you. And then you come in. And now, interestingly enough, in the rural land that I just bought, little town, 400 people in the town, right? Rural. Went to the diner the other day. Not a damn sign anywhere. Not oh, yeah, a yeah. mask. Every, every diner booth is full of people eating hamburgers and chicken fried steak. And it was wonderful. Yep. Felt, it, it, people being drank, human. Drank some tea, had some chicken fried steak. Hey, hey though, listen. Missouri's full, guys. <laughs> that's, the only place fuller right. than Missouri is Oklahoma. Uh, you were talking about going to the restaurant or going to the closing, you know, and they're making you wear a mask. And you know, or, Did they make you wear a mask? No. Hand they, sanitizer? They did. They did. All yeah, that? They, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 And um, <laughs> everything's so odd. A, a, guy, a guy wrote a poem and posted it in the comments on the online Great Books podcast feed. Yeah. Listen to this. His name's Chris Kleinfelter. I assume you've cleared this. It's okay to say. His well, he name. posted as a comment on oh, with on his a name public, on, on a public, public deal, floor. you know. Okay, okay. And uh, he's okay. a member there. He's a good guy. He writes okay. a lot of poetry. He says, "I wonder if I were young in this year of plague, you know, like before when I was in my prime, and the life of juggling was still to come, would I be likely to fall in love at first sight from six feet away, like I did that day long ago by the river when a blind girl asked my name and my eyes became hers?" All in a moment, could I see the fine person beneath the N95 mask if I had the nerve to ask? Would I show up with roses and rubber-gloved hands and say that I liked hers with delicate fingers showing beautifully beneath tight-stretched latex? How could we find the magic moment when PPE must fall and all our souls bear all with courage and passion in spite of the pall, making it hard to see the ones we long to touch? It's pretty good. Pretty good. It's but pretty like, good. What, is, what does romance look like? Oh, God, I can't imagine. <sighs> yeah. I can't imagine. Well, and you know, again, we're the lucky ones because we're in the Midwest, which is a little more rural, a little more spread out. And so most of the cities in the Midwest have at least partially open. Imagine what it'd be like to still be in Manhattan and have everything closed. I don't want to be in Manhattan. Things are normal. Yeah. I don't, but no. not right now. No way, man. You couldn't pay me enough. Uh, Caitlin. This is one of our female this, listeners. This is our 26 female listeners. She says, Excellent. Another female listener here started listening to you guys earlier this year at the recommendation of my husband. I was previously at a classes only studio, which I fully credit for getting me interested in working out again. Um, her knees and such started feeling beat up. Uh, she says, I can't even tell you how grateful I am for your podcast introducing me to LP. Today I deadlifted 205 for five for a new PR than most I ever did before. That was 135. He said, I keep remembering what you guys say about <laughs> That's time. That's a big jump, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, something ain't right there, huh? May, well, it may, what she may have meant was it was the most she'd ever deadlifted before she started this program. Yeah. Maybe. Anyway, but that's she, good. She said, okay. I kept remembering what you say about time speeding up when you're lifting, and two seconds feel like 15. She said, my last rep felt like it took forever, but it went up and my knees don't hurt, and I'm a little heavier than I was when I was doing those cardio classes, but I feel like I move around way easier. She said, uh, this is way longer winded than I anticipated. More women should listen. It's more fun to be strong than skinny. I have a lot more to go and for some People, uh, my numbers are their warm ups, but I'm proud of them. Yeah, I'm proud of you too, ma'am. Way awesome. to go. Good job. Good job, Caitlin. Hey, uh, do what Caitlin says, women. Listen to us. You're, t you're speaking to an audience who isn't listening. <laughs> I know, I know, but the joke's good. The go I got to go where the comedy is, man. You know? The uh, What I love about it is, is like we act like it's this, you know, it, first off, congrats to Caitlin. Great yeah, job. That's great. But then here's the thing. Caitlin's not the exception exception to the rule. That's Caitlin's what happens when anyone trains, mm -hmm. regardless of your demographic. We we t way too often in the fitness world try to make this about demographics. Oh, you're young, you're old, you're skinny, you're fat, you're male, you're female. Listen, this stuff works for everybody. Yep, you will PR. Only, it, You'll PR. That's the deal. You just go PR. It's kind of funny. I've got, I had a bunch of clients do the online uh, mm. lockdown smackdown. And the last day or two, sorry, clients, for what I'm about to say. I, I love you. And so hear, hear, the, hear the heart behind what I'm about to say. They're, they're reporting back to me about how they did, how they placed in the lockdown smack. Oh, no, no, no. And they don't understand that I don't care at all how they placed. I've already celebrated what they did. They, they all went out and hit PRs. I don't care if they took first or third or didn't place at all. If they went out and hit three PRs or for some, for actually a handful of my clients, it was the first meet they ever did. So that's to great. even post a total, that's wonderful. And so, man, I couldn't care less. Like, I listen, I know for some of you guys out there, you want to figure out where you place, but I just don't, it just doesn't matter to me where you place. It's an awesome thing to just compete, to get out there and hit the PRs get and your try. Number. 
And uh, so I'm, I'm really proud of my clients for doing that. Not that being said, Big John Floater comes in second yeah. in the middleweight uh, for his, in his division, right? Yeah, and by the way, in about a in about a seven or eight day peak, like like a, like right. eight days out from the meet, he's like, "Hey, I'm thinking about. I've just he's been doing LP for a long time. Come, you know, he's been coming coming back from one of his little layoffs that he has every once in a while. So we've been we've been doing LP. He's like, "What do you think about me doing the?" The online meet. I was like, yeah, let's do it. Like, you're pretty strong. He's at the point in LP where he's hitting PRs in LP again for, you know, the fourth mm-hmm. time that he's ever done LP. So he's, but he hasn't done any triples or doubles or singles or anything. So we just had him do like one or two workouts of low reps going into the, the lockdown smackdown. And the guy, <laughs> the guy did really well. So he just, you know, and I think he would still tell you he let, you know, he's not, he's not at his all time best. He's, but he's, Oh, he's yeah, got lots. Of, he's got many years of PRs in front of him, and then uh, Charity's client Ed Keen. He won the uh, yeah. Masters middle weights. Not just and not just client, but coach for us too. Yeah. So Eddie is a Eddie is a dude. What a great his story is awesome because he started as as just a client and uh, started with, as my client, and then had Charity start working with him. We worked with him together when Charity was a an, an Uber early intern, and then she's taken over as his head coach for several years now. And uh, and then he went and passed the PBC, and now he's a coach for us, and he works for us. And what a great guy! He did he's, great. He's super nice guy. Proud of him. Jay, Jay says thanks for all the content you put out. I am 32 years old with young kids. My recovery is not optimal. I would consider myself to be an intermediate lifter. He says I'm having sinus and septum surgery. What would you change, if anything, programming wise, leading up to the surgery? He's got some more questions nothing. here, but we'll leave it at that. Yeah, nothing. Now, after the surgery. <laughs> yeah. And then he says, the doctor said no heavy lifting for a week after. If it was you, how would you go about returning to training? Oof. Uh, so, so we the always doc- have to The say doctor says time. one week. So that's- I, That scares me. I'll be honest. Now, I've had several clients do this, and this tends to be the comment. I wonder, though, how often doctors understand the pressure that our clients are under Isn't under a, a strong Valsalva and lifting. Now, if you do the a Valsalva correct, most of the pressure should be below the or south of the glottis. But for a lot of people, it's not. There's a lot of pressure in their face. And so I'd come back pretty slow and just test her out a little bit and see how it goes. I definitely would not try to speed up the process. I wouldn't touch anything for a week after that surgery. I can't imagine after having a a deviated septum surgery and you've got all these i mean your nose you've got like gauze stuffed up your nose oh, yeah. and they're trying to clot those clot the blood and i you know you think about how often you see a, a power lifter get a bloody nose squatting and to squat real heavy one week after a surgery like that i think i'd be that that doesn't seem wise that doesn't seem logical to me so no. i think i'd start light i don't think i'd have a real hard valsalva i think i'd you know how many times have we thought a doctor was too aggressive? That's like the first time in my life. Uh, yeah, all the tissue up in there is really vascular. You know, people get nosebleeds just when they sneeze sometimes. Yeah. You know, and if you're going to have some work in whatever. there, I'd lay off for two or three weeks. I think I would too. Like, com- I com- lay completely off if you want. If you for a week for sure, and like if you want to come back after a week or two and you want to start doing some real light body weight stuff, put an bar- empty barbell on your back, depending on how much you squat, maybe you do one thirty five. But like, I wouldn't be pushing. I wouldn't try. I wouldn't reduce what you're working with by 10% and jump back in. No, I think that's no. a real bad idea. Yeah, wait, wait, wait two or three weeks, I think. And then he says, well, how would you go back to training? Um, I assume that you're going to have a general anesthesia. And I have found if you've undergone general, there's something about it. Like, you know, those those drugs it. are toxic. They yep. kill muscle cells. They kill brain cells. I mean, it ain't good. Uh, you're going to have to deload 15% minimum, I would say. When people go under general, it messes them up bad. No, I would agree. I I think I would deload fifty percent and then just make you know like maybe jump five percent every yeah, workout. Fair fifty, fifty-five, sixty, sixty-five, seventy, seventy-five. So in you know in three weeks you're back to where you were by jump you know something like that yeah. just to make sure everything is fine. By the way, uh, just a quick note on that general anesthesia. You know, I've had a handful of, of surgeries, hernias, and appendectomy and stuff like that. The only time in my life that I think I was truly clinically depressed for about 10 days or two weeks was immediately after general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. It screwed me up. Like, it was weird. And I remember Rachel going, what is wrong with you? And I mean, I couldn't point to anything. 
other than the fact that I had gone, I had gone under for this procedure and that was it. And I mean, I, dude, I was depressed. I couldn't point yeah. to it. I didn't know what it was. I wasn't anxious. I wasn't worried about, it. I just wanted to crawl into a hole and die. And it was, and it was from general, I don't, that's all, that's all I can come up with is that it's from general anesthesia. So yeah, it is ta- nasty. I, they take I you to death's door, as as I can. you know, it, they take you oh, to yeah, death's door sure. and then bring you back. You know, it's, it's, yeah, you're, 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 you're dropping at 50% ain't wrong, you know, fit, but yeah. Um, general anesthesia is pretty tough, even if uh, even if you don't have trouble with bleeders in your nose and all that stuff. Just yeah. just getting knocked out is bad. James, you, wait a minute. Would you like me to read a review? Is it positive or negative? Oh, it's both. Okay, then let's hear it. Very good. Five stars. Okay. Scott Great is awesome. Super smart. Interesting opinions. <laughs> While Reynolds is obviously knowledgeable, his personality doesn't always agree with me. A little full of himself at times, but I listen every week and appreciate the content. Well, thank you. That's nice and probably accurate. Yeah. And then and then, then this other guy, he says, Matt is cool. Scott believes he's much more intelligent than he is. <laughs> that is not it. That is not it. Scott is very intelligent. Well, the, Matt the, is also cool. No, slightly cooler Matt, than you're, Scott. But also a little more full of myself. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. Uh, so oh, ridiculous. God. People are so nuts. Again, it comes down to this thing. I have these podcasts that I love, and right. I've heard a podcast that I hate, and I've never written any of them. It's so odd. It's but so to weird, be fair, isn't it? To be fair, I ask them to do it. That is true. That is true. James says, thanks for the great content. Uh, he really enjoyed the great the getting started series. He says he's 42, 5'11", and 190 pounds, starting LP, uh, where I, after a long layoff, I had gotten to a 365 squat, 400 deadlift, et cetera. He says, I've noticed that you never mention post-workout stretches. Are you not mentioning it because it is a given, like the warm-up, or do you really not find it necessary? Let's say at the same time, three, two, one. We not don't necessary. stretch. Yeah, not necessary. Not necessary. My my oldest daughter has started training with us again. Um, she had trained pretty hard LP last year, and eh, we all got in a tizzy, and she stopped. Sure. But she got back at it, and and we went we went pretty darn light on her first session, and um, the next day she wasn't sore. Well, the second day afterwards she was pretty sore, and uh, she came in the kitchen. And she said, "Oh my God, I think I made everything worse." So what are you talking about? <laughs> She's like, I, I, my legs are really sore, so I thought I would stretch. And she's like, it wrecked me. Yeah. And then uh, then we went out and squatted. And she, after we got done, she's like, feels so much better. Yep. Yeah. Uh, he said, also found it interesting, th- th- this this sort of passive voice that these people use, there's something about it. Like, it's not James's fault, but it just gets under my skin. Sure. Also found it interesting, sentence fragment, also found it interesting that pull-ups and or rows are not included in the Getting Started series. It's not interesting. We don't get people started with pull-ups and rows, Bubba. Right. That's kind of step two. We, we, we really thought about what we were doing. Yeah. I mean, it's really that. Like, listen, pull-ups and rows are pretty foundational, mm-hmm. but not so foundational that we start with them. Right. It's that simple, right? So the Getting Started series does, we don't do pull-ups and rows in the beginning. We do the four main lifts. That's what we do in the beginning. And eventually we'll add pull-ups and rows at some point. They're chin-ups usually first. Yeah, but, we're going to uh, have... I want to have dudes chinning and rowing by week six or so. Yeah. Maybe. But maybe not usually in week one. Maybe later. Uh, he says, um, finally, on my last round through LP, I felt like I got okay strong, stronger than I've ever been. But when I tried an incline bench, it was so weak, I found it concerning. Yeah, it's novelty, man. It's yeah, it's novelty. Lift, right? So it's like, uh, you know, it's it's just, I, I remember yeah, I, I, we did a, uh, the podcast last week uh, about kind of getting into strongman and playing with some strongman. I remember I was a 700 pound deadlifter the first time I ever tried a strongman stone. And I can remember that a 230 pound strongman stone almost killed me to try to get a, a sure. 230 pound stone onto a platform. And they're like, how's that even possible? It's the novelty of the lift, right? I can't incline anything anymore. It just tears my shoulders up. I can't, I can't incline. So you know, it doesn't mean that you're not strong. It means that you're not used to the movement. Like, here's a here's a better example. I've I've been at times in my life a pretty decent presser and bench presser, and I used to work with when I was a strength coach at the high school. I'd work with the throwing team. I always thought it'd be cool to throw, right? Throw shot, throw sure. discus. It's a cool sport, and plus, like the practices are easy. 
and you get to live in the athlete dorms and eat the good food and stuff. And so, you know, I had a way higher bench press, as did my training partner, Johnny Gold at the time, then who was a coach, than any of our any of our throwers. And I'm talking we're talking about some big boys, some boys that were 260, 270, 280, and they might have had bench presses of 300, 315, 330, but we had bench presses of like 430. Johnny had one of 485. Woo. Those guys could throw shot f- the high school kids way further than John and I could. Yep. Is it because they were stronger than us? No, it's because there's a novelty to the movement. It takes a while to learn the technique. And I think if you started to play around with with your incline, then you would find the same thing. Now, here's an interesting thing that I've noticed. Everybody bench presses more than they overhead press. Yep. Your incline is going to be somewhere between the two. Yep. If you think about laying on the bench like you're going to bench press and your arm's vertical, that you got a right angle between your chest and your arm. And then if you're standing and pressing, it's a 180 degree angle between your arm and your chest. That's right. The incline's somewhere in between there. Yep. So will the weight be. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's fine. Exactly right. It's fine. And if you practice it, it'll go up a little bit. But it's never going to be heavier than your bench press, and it's going to be something less than your than your press press. Over higher than your press press, lower than your bench press. Can we start calling it the press press? I like the press press. Let's do that. I like it. Michael says. First of all, thank you guys for educating those of us interested in blah, 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 blah. You're welcome. He says, I'm 5'11", 247 pounds. My squat is 350 for a 3x5. Press is 180 for a 3x5. F- f- Benching Strong. 250, okay. uh, 400 for, for a set of five. Okay. Guys, um, He says, how's it sound like I'm doing? <laughs> sounds like you're strong, man. Yeah, it sounds like you're real strong. At 5'11 and 247 uh, you don't say you don't say how old you are here, uh, but I'd want to have a conference call, a little phone call, consult with you, and uh, maybe talk about your waistline. That's exactly what I was going to say. Waist measurement. Let's just see. Let's look at health metrics. Yeah, to look at you. Look at your waistline. Uh, maybe we would we would talk about that. But we would talk about next goals. It might be bring the waist down, enter your first meet. You know something. You know you, sure. you're you're at a crossroads. Would be my guess. But it sounds like you're doing very well. Yes. Uh, proud of you. Doing good there, Michael. Let's see here. I got another one here. Where the heck was it? These are all emails that were sent to the wrong email address. Okay. We had to forward them from... No, they were kind of in the hole. They weren't even forwarded. Uh, Jared says, curious if Matt is part of online great books. Also curious where Matt and Scott disagree as it relates to theological views, worldviews, philosophical, et cetera. This may take an entire podcast, but I'd like to hear it. I'm not in online great books, and I would really... We disagree on everything. That's what I responded to him. (laughs) That's... I would really like to be in online great books. In fact, like there is a time coming when I really want to do the thing. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever have heard about this, but, but I'm I'm running a business that continues to grow so fast, and I'm just trying to keep my head above water and not drown. And so, uh, and and the problem is, is that I understand. I've read a lot of books, and I've also dabbled a little bit with the books, even in going to Scott and and Brett's uh, in person. The thing that basically launched the online great books it's tonight. Uh, tonight, you guys are meeting. And uh, it's it's not the same thing as reading as reading uh, the effective executive. It's not, and the, and you know I've, I read some business books that are tough. It doesn't sniff a candle to Aristotle or to Thomas Aquinas or or whatever. I mean, it's it's tough. So you no, know, I'm not in it yet, but I need to do it. I really want to do it. You know, Trent Trent joined us. Producer Trent's in there with us. Yeah, and, and and Jordan too. And we were talking the other day, and he, you know, he trains hard, barbells, you know, and works his butt off and everything. He said, this is harder. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, that's the reason. So the real answer is, is I just pushed out, and I haven't. It, it's, it's, it's hard, and it's really frustrating. You know, and when you get, uh, as you do it, people can't see it. You know, there's like, if you get real strong, they're like, man, I hadn't seen you in a while. You're, got, you know, gosh, you got yeah. great big, you look jacked, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we don't get the, the kind of the feedback from it that you would from a uh, weight training. And sure. it's, uh, it's tough. It's tough. You know, on the, like on the disagreements with theology and stuff like that, like there's a it's lot everything. of stuff that we disagree on, but I think the main point there is that the reason Scott and I get along, I think about a lot of that stuff is because we're, we both think about it enough to have an opinion that has required some significant amounts of thought. You know, I, we, I struggle with people who believe what mom and dad taught them to believe and have never questioned or read or thought or used logic or wisdom. And we are both very logical wise 
not wise, but we use logic and reason, reason's a better word, to try to think about those things. And so, yeah, while we don't exactly see eye to eye on all that stuff, um, that's not really the goal, right? The goal is to figure out. No, the goal is to get you to see eye to eye with me. <laughs> that's the goal. Of, that is, is the, the goal. goal of online great books is to get every single person in OGB to see eye to eye exactly with Scott Hamburg. No, no, no. My goal in life is just to get you to agree with me. Oh, it's to get me to sp- sp- yes. specifically to, to agree right. with you. I gotcha. Yeah. Makes sense. You know, my Instagram feed's nuts. I know. It's nuts. And there's a lady at online great books. She's like, oh my gosh, is this, is, you know, is the goal of online great books like the same as your, you know? I'm like, no, it's not. Like, I don't lead any of the seminars. Right. You know, it's just to get you people to read. That's all. Right. And then right. participate. I don't lead any of the seminars. I just kind of, I just operate the thing. You know, I don't have any expected outcome there whatsoever, except that, you know, that people, people actually do it. Uh, Thomas says, a uh, big fan of the show, especially the MED series. He says, uh, you often talk about where lifters should be at various stages based on the age, weight, height, et cetera. But I wonder what the data versus anecdotes would show. Any commentary would be necessary or would be appreciated. So it's interesting. There's an interesting background of this. I don't know that you know this yet, Scott, but we hired a we hired a guy. His name's Greg. Works for us. He's a uh, a legit statistician. He's a he's an analyst for us. And so we now have data. By the way, we crossed over. Did you see me? I don't know if you saw this post that I made on Slack the other day. We crossed over one million prime exercises since we launched the online coaching. So one million squats, deadlifts, bench presses, and presses since we launched and we're at 370,000 workouts uh which is pretty crazy and we have data for every single every single one of those and so figuring out we can actually we can actually see what the data says now we put in any demographic we want right so you could be like I want a 35 year old male in the Pacific Northwest that's whatever 510 and weighs between 175 and 185 what are their numbers 32 workouts in boom we've got we can extrapolate that data which is pretty cool. So we're going to start publishing a lot more of that because nobody else has ever been able to get access to that data, and we've yeah. got a we've got an amount of data now that we can pull. So uh, I'm I'm sure who's this? What's the what's the emailer's name here? I don't know. I deleted it. <laughs> okay, sir. Whatever your name was, uh, I'm sure you're right. There's probably some places. I'm sh- I'm certain. In fact, there's some places where we are probably off a little bit anecdotally, and the data will show that. And uh, at some point, the da- you're, are you shaking your head now? Well, I mean, yeah, it will. But the thing is, you know, it, this is going to make it, almost every single person mad. The data doesn't matter because it doesn't well, it does, actually it, tell it you anything. Well, it tells – the data matters to the company, us. It shouldn't matter to you personally right. in how you compare yourself to other people. So if you're like, well, all the other guys that are 35 and are my height right. and weight are lifting this and I'm more or less, that means I'm better or worse. No, it doesn't. It actually comes back to the very first thing we talked about. PRs, man. That's what matters. Just go out and keep hitting PRs. It doesn't matter what you like what yeah. you know, imagine like we we have these people that that are that train with us that have all sorts of like physical abnormalities. You have people who have like re- hip replacements and knee yeah. replacements and polio and they're missing an arm and they got fused back or they they got spondy in their back or they've I mean all kinds of weird stuff, you know? And and you just can't compare like those people have to go out and set PRs too. And so just yep. go and set PRs. Like the, the, the point is that you get stronger. And so this, uh, this idea, listen, I get being a 22 year old kid wanting to compete at strength sports and compare yourself against other 22 year old kids. But at some point you're 35 or 40 or 45 or beyond. And don't you realize the value of what we do is in actually just getting strong and improving your quality of life and not, to put the ribbon around your neck and wear the medal and say like, Hey, I'm better than everybody else or I'm worse or it just doesn't matter. And you know, a couple of weeks ago, somebody said, uh, went to the doctor and I got my labs back and they said this. Yeah. And he gave us an interpretation. He didn't actually say what the numbers were on the labs. Right. And I'm no doctor, but me and you both almost simultaneously said your labs don't say that. That's right. That's right. And, and in terms of stats, uh, this guy also asks a question about using st- stat statistics to drive programming changes. Right. No. Um, um, unless it's stats for th- for that person. I love taking stats for that individual person, and I can say, you know, back when I coached you, I could look at you, your training history and look at the stats of your training history right. and how you trained, and that would help influence 
future programming. Yeah. But outside of that, like, where's the, where's the help? Well, maybe we could get a bunch of statistical information about what a midweek deloads it does at the end of the LP. Sure. And, but, but it doesn't matter because there still has to be an interpretive, the interpretive work done. And then there has to be, uh, there has to be new tests devised and, the, and, and you never get at the truth. You never get at the truth. This is this whole sort of Reddit uh, mindset sources. Right. The, the experience is paramount. You know, you, you, you know what a syllogism is out there, listener? You say, all men are mortals. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is immortal. You can use deductive reasoning to prove, if you have a solid you know, syllogism like that, you can prove stuff to a dead certainty. Make it perfect. We can prove that Socrates is immortal. But in this induction thing, which is really what the scientific method is, you can't actually prove anything. Like, I can't prove to you that if I drop a ball, it's going to fall. Now, we've dropped a million balls, and they always fell. Right. But I can't prove to you that the next one's not going to fall. Now, we're going to pretend like we know, and we're going to proceed in that way. But almost every single thing that, I'm, I'm making air quotes here, science has ever said was wrong. And almost every single thing that science right now is telling us is wrong. Like Ptolemy said the universe looked like this. Copernicus said it looked like that. Galileo said it looked different. Newton said it acted in a different way. Einstein said something else. Everything that everybody has said has been proven wrong. You were supposed to take fish oil. Now you're not. You were supposed to eat a baby aspirin. Now you're not. Almost everything they've ever said was wrong. And whatever they're telling you right now is wrong too. <laughs> right. It's yep. our best guess. Right? There are gradations of wrongness. Sure. Newton was less wrong than Ptolemy. That's, the thing. That's right. But quit acting like it's the gospel and think, quit acting like you're actually going to get a fucking answer because you're not. Right. Tired no, I think, I, and I do think data is interesting. And I think, think there's stuff we like, we're doing all kinds of fun stuff with the data. But to say that, hey, because the data shows this. We are going to specifically, or not just specifically, but we are certain that we can program for you, sir, this way. That's We know that's not true, right? Really what the data shows is what the middle of the bell curve is anyway. Right. It, it, you know, it shows trends. It shows trend lines. We can use it to say, hey, what we've seen is, is we, when a client misses four workouts in a row, four workouts in a row, they become big time red flag for like becoming MIA or quitting. Right. So that's a way we can use data then to reach like so at three workouts missed or two workouts missed, we elevate the communication out to our clients to say like, okay, we, we have a we have a potential red flag coming. Let's nip that in the bud and help them get back on the horse after after a couple workouts missed instead of after four or whatever that number is. And so and, we can use it that way. And you might be entirely wrong because the whole in business climate has changed. Like your data you had about four week whatever. Sure. Now, Who knows right now, now know? those people don't have access to a gym. Maybe they're actually just, you know, of course, right? So, yeah, I, what, I don't know. I that just gotta, is a, that I is a supplement to logic and reason and experience. We use experience, logic, and reason first when the data helps continue to like. Oh, we're like, oh, this is interesting. That's you know supports that. It makes sense. But the the problem is that you get with this idea of like scientism is the people that say without without the sources source question mark Source, sources data question mark like where are those things and therefore therefore it isn't real it isn't true there is no like you're like you know if i drop a ball ten thousand times in a row and it goes straight down sources like where are the sources that prove that the body <laughs> and, yeah the science scientism's out of control and and be clear like we're not anti-science and we're not no. anti-data we're actually like i'm pro both I, I i like that stuff it's really interesting stuff but it's not my religion. You, you remember like in the seventh or eighth grade and they're like, here's the scientific method. And you design an experiment yep, and sure. you get controls and you, and you test your hypothesis, yep. blah, blah, blah. I want to add on the end of that, that uh, we have to have an actual technological or engineering application of the thing before we accept it as a theory. Sure. If it doesn't keep the bridge from falling down or the airplane in the sky or whatever, have a practical technological application or engineering application, 
uh, we don't hang our hat on it. It's it's sure. it's still well, even up then. I remember what is the word? It would, if we even if we do, it's a theory. Right. We accept it as a theory, which doesn't mean we've accepted it as absolute fact. It's not our, our standard fact. for theory. It's a theory is, that we've tested that appears to to be right, but it's still just an appearance. It's yeah. not a you know. It's not a plant your flag in it. On our, our, our standard for theory is too is is too low. I think. Too, yeah, yeah. I, I want to add be. to the end of the uh, scientific method. Um, Anthony says, really enjoying the show. How much stock do you as coaches put into volume PRs versus weight PRs? I understand what he's saying. Yeah, I do too. And I think, I think he's, well, let's, let's, so first off, there are, uh, right now in the middle of COVID-19 where I can't necessarily increase the intensity for a lot of my clients. Mm -hmm. We're just keeping things like volume PRs or tonnage PRs because they only have a 35 pound kettlebell. So I have to do it for as many, you know, or we keep frequency <laughs> PRs or, and, and listen, that's not nearly as fun. Uh, but I think there's times when it's valuable. I think the next most valuable piece of data <laughs> to, to bring it back to the last question after weight on the bar is tonnage, which is the combination of weight on the bar and volume. And then you can go to things like volume, but the problem with volume, we've talked about this before, as its own, like, okay, I hit a new, I hit a new 20 rep max on X. Mm. Well, that doesn't carry over to strength. Like that's not, it's not specific enough. It's not that, you know, specific adaptation to impose demands. Like how how what is the demand of a 20 rep max on anything? Muscle endurance, you know, how how much you can fight through lactate buildup and you know the the bullshit of like horrible pain of glycolysis going real like that's it's not strength and so and so that's the problem with just volume prs now what i do have volume prs is like on chins which which is weight right so i'll have somebody like maybe they can do maybe they can do a set of three and a and a double and a single so they hit they hit six reps total the next workout i'm going to say hit eight reps don't care how many in as few sets as possible and we're going to go 10 reps or maybe just 11 or what or you know whatever and go up. And so that would be ways that I might use volume to drive increases. Something like a chin. I care about tonnage. Although I don't have to count it very much cuz I do the MED That's thing. Right. And and I always want to follow one of our rules which is you know stress goes up so it's always going to be heavier so I know as long as I'm making the proper MED change the tonnage is always going up. But I will track 3 by 5 5 by 5 1 by 5 1 by 8. Yep. Um I don't really care about anything bigger than than that. Like a ten rep PR. The case are three I sets of ten right now. He's kind of in a. He's in a. Let's let his joints rest a little bit, and it sucks. And he's just. But you know, we're getting some volume in, and that's terrible. Yeah, it sucks. I I don't want to do it, but I I program it for him. Not much longer. Actually, he's down to eights now, but he's been on tens for a while. Man, I think that's a show. That's good. Let's wrap her up. But but I want everybody to go do this. Go do this. I've, I've been asking you, and now I'm telling you. Uh, go to go to Spotify, pick out one of our one of our shows that is your favorite, yes. and you can hit the share button and you can share it to your Instagram story. I think that's the best way for you to pass it to somebody else, and uh, and help and help us uh, grow our listener base. That's what we need you to do. We, we are we don't we don't charge you anything. You're all our freeloaders. Yeah, and let's be clear. Like we're ne- we are currently in negotiations with Spotify. I don't know if you guys heard. Joe Rogan just sold uh, his entire library uh, to Spotify yesterday for $100 million. And so um, they're also negotiating with us. And so we, we're hoping to get somewhere in the same ballpark, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. But like your, your sharing of our episodes would help us get that $100 million number. For I ain't them. taking the ticket. <laughs> if, if, if I take money for them, they own me and they're going to say, oh, you can't say that. <laughs> that's what I do anyway. You can't say that. No, uh, you say, you're I, like, hey, I'm, I say whatever I want. And then I go to Trent and I go, you got to cut that four minutes out. You can't, you can't say that. <laughs> oh no, Spotify. You know, Spotify is offered, was. Didn't Spotify? They're the one that bought um that bought Gimlet. I think for four hundred million. Yeah, that's so, dude. That's so I mean, crazy. think about that. Gimlet was a like a three year old podcast company that had ten podcasts. Or sell your there. Spotify stock. I don't even know if it's publicly traded, but if it is, get out. Hundred million dollars. I, I like Spotify. Uh, I think as a service, it works well. But that that's I don't see. I don't see how that stuff makes any They're, sense, I mean, man. Listen, I, I don't worry about that as much as you know. Good for Joe, by the way. Good for Joe. Good for Joe Rogan. Hundred million dollars. That motherfucker cashed out. 
He had enough anyway. Hey, the, by the way, you know, Jared, was it Jared that asked this question? Here's a perfect example of one of the main things that Scott, that Scott and I would dis- disagree on. I'm like, dude, that guy has had the, that he's had the most influential podcast in the world. Does he have enough money? Yes, he does. Spotify gave him a hundred million dollars. I say, take it and run. I'd keep podding my way. You know, Spotify is one of the first people that started that deplatformed Alex Jones. There have been others. Are you sure that that was Spotify? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm 98 percent sure. I'm not looking well, it up now, on Google I'm not, right here's now. Here's the deal. I'll, I'll but, only say this: Joe's not dumb, and the kind of stuff that oh, he. Oh, wait a minute. Well, Joe's not dumb, dude. When it comes to business, like I don't think Joe's got an IQ of 160. Jo- Joe got a hundred million dollars. That's all Joe knows. And Joe don't give a I'll shit bet, about whether. I'll bet there's a clause in there that says they absolutely, under no circumstances, can they have no editorial control over over his stuff. Yeah, I bet there's a social media company and a and a in a uh, streaming service that says they have no editorial control. You're kidding me. There's no way <laughs> they'll let him say anything that he wants on his platform. You're the re- insane one now. Mm-hmm. You know, my, some of my favorite J- Rogan shows are like the ones with Jones or Graham Hancock. He's like this crazy guy that talks about like uh, uh, these ge- uh, geological like c- catastrophes in North America, like in the, you know, you know, he's a crazy guy. Right. But I just love that stuff. It's so fun and interesting. Right. You know, these guys don't think like normal people. You're not. You're going to see less of that mm. on his show. See. Yeah, Spotify's going to be like. I think it'd be really good if you had Billie Eilish on your show because she would bring <laughs> this demographic, and he's going to be just having just stupid shit on his show. <laughs> It'll be. That's what you, I mean, that, but that's you may what be happens. right. I may be wrong. You, you take the ticket. That's what happens. Yep. yep. He, I agree. I, gosh, he's making so much money just out of his warehouse. He's like, yeah, I want an extra hundred. Like, pff, I don't get it, man. I get it. I get it, Joe. You get that squirrel by the nut. All right, that's it. They, no, the squirrel. The, <laughs> they got him. The squirrel they gets got you by nuts. the nut. That's not <laughs> how it works, right? All right, let's wrap it up. Hey, listen, I'm holding it in a poop, and my tushy is calling my name. I got to get in there All and right. do my business, and then and then get a little butt wash and freshen up. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Share this thing on Spotify, whatever your favorite podcatcher is. There's a share button on there. Please do that and share your favorite show with one of your friends. And that would be a big help to us. And we will talk to you in a few days. 